Hi there, I'm Lauren Langworthy and I'm here with Wisconsin Farmers Union. I'm the director of special projects at this organization and one of the big things that we've focused on for almost 100 years now is cooperative business efforts that support rural communities and agricultural communities in their goals. We're here today with Ryan and I'll let him introduce himself a little bit um, and also my colleague Matthew. Hi, my name is Matthew Conti. I'm a rural organizer here at Wisconsin Farmers Union, and we're really excited to bring you this series on collective uh, business models. Well, uh, thank you for taking some time uh, to meet with us. Um, could you just introduce yourself and explain a little bit about the work that you do? Yeah, uh, my name is Ryan Kauf. I'm the executive director of WICEO. Uh, that's the short version. The long version is Wisconsin Center for Employee Ownership. Uh, we were planted in Wisconsin by this organization called EOX, or the Employee Ownership Expansion Network. And their goal is to put a physical center for employee ownership in every state. And right now we're just over halfway there. Uh, Wisconsin started in 2022. Um, early that year, they put a board together, and then in late uh, 2023, they hired me on to be that first kind of boots on the ground. And the reason for that is um, there are some states that have some really good employee ownership um, uh, tools and resource partners, like, for example, in Wisconsin, um, you know, the Wisconsin Farmers Union is uh, very responsible for many, uh, most of the co-ops um, in Wisconsin, and many people work with the University of Wisconsin Center for uh, Center for Cooperatives. Again, that a resource like that is not typical in every state. Um, some states have really good um, national ESOP association local chapters. Wisconsin is actually one of those that has probably one of the best um, chapters of the ESOP association. But again, a lot of states don't have that. Some states have um, uh, employee ownership centers that were started at universities, like in New Jersey at Rutgers or um, in Ohio, like at Kent State. But again, we don't have that here in, in Wisconsin. So the idea is if we put a person in every state who can talk about the three main employee ownership forms with any business that is looking for an exit strategy, um, what happens is more employee owned companies actually come to fruition in that state. Um, and so we provide technical assistance to any Wisconsin based business um, that wants to uh, transition into employee ownership or start as an employee ownership company. Um, and again, we worked with uh, partners to do that, like the UW Center for Cooperatives um, and uh, the ESOP Association chapter in Wisconsin, which provides an affiliate membership um, specifically for companies who are um, exploring an employee ownership uh, ESOP, uh, for example, um, in that. And then in addition to that, those are probably the two um, employee ownership forms that are most known because typically you know somebody who works in one. Um, but there's another one called an employee ownership trust, which is newer um, to the United States. And that is really good for companies that are much smaller than worker cooperatives and much, much smaller than um, than ESOPs. Yeah, and we wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Could you just explain yeah. to us kind of the concept of the worker-owned trust and how it mm -hmm. differs from traditional ownership models or how it differs from those uh, cooperative models? Yeah, I mean, in general, when you kind of look at the ESOP or the employee stock ownership plan, which is a retirement plan, and you look at that worker-owned cooperative and then you look at this employee ownership trust, there's a couple of main differences. Um, one is, as you know, worker cooperatives and uh, can be really any size company. So can the employee ownership uh, trust. Typically with an ESOP, you want more than 10 employees um, and you want a fairly healthy um, EBITDA, which is a, a, a finance-based term um for that company um 
the you know that that employee ownership trust has some advantages and disadvantages just like those other forms of um employee ownership uh like a worker cooperative the setup and ongoing costs for an employee ownership trust are a little bit lower uh, than the ESOP although I will say this with the ESOP there's this myth that it's really really expensive to start and things like that but if you compare that to say a broker's commission to try to sell that company it's you know not even not even really close to that um the other part with employee uh, uh ownership trusts is that there's a lot of flexibility um in the model uh i really like the worker owned cooperative seven principles you can take those principles and put them into um the trust uh, the purpose trust. Um, in addition to that, that employee ownership trust is a trust where the employees are set up as the beneficiaries. And it's a little more similar to an ESOP where um, you would take the profitability of the company. And if the employees are the beneficiary of that trust, those trust documents would spell out um, essentially how the employees share in the profit of that company. I'll just say, I really like this idea, um, particularly from the perspective of maybe adding a layer of protection almost. Uh, if a business isn't maybe right. incredibly profitable, that trust can then sit in between the two entities and provide a little buffer zone, sort right. of. Yeah, because you have to have a trustee with every trust. Um, in addition to that, just like the ESOP and that worker cooperative, there is a board um, that's involved. And again, just like in every work um, employee ownership model, the employees can become part of that board and then also uh, hire a CEO, things like that. In the employee ownership trust model, typically speaking, what happens is um, there is some kind of conversion from the current state to that employee ownership trust. Um, the owner of the company is typically paid over time um, at a fair market value for the company. And typically that owner stays on as the CEO um, in that company, not always, but typically. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that that owner needs to, you know, be done with the company. The nice thing about that is, um, if that owner, uh, doesn't have a lot of time, uh, you can keep them on for a small amount of time or a large amount of time. And, uh, then kind of transition that executive succession, um, you know, really based on whatever the trust document says. So the flexibility in that is 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 there um, depending on, you know, the situation at hand. Definitely. Uh, kind of piggybacking on that, uh, mm -hmm. what are some key benefits for workers uh, when they are um, taking part in an employee-owned uh, trust? Yeah, I mean, I think in this one with the employee ownership trust, the the biggest benefit really is that um, you take the trust document and you prepare it so that the when the owners are the beneficiaries, essentially the number one advantage is they are sharing in the profit. So you can you can set that up um, as well. But also because of the flexibility, they also share. Um, in the governance of that company. So they have um, they have a say in how the company uh, is operated. So again, whatever that trust document says, typically you're going to talk about um, the governance, the board, um, and things like that in there. But when you are funding the company, when the shares get valued, when that trustee is selected, um, while the owner of the company is responsible for that first transition, uh, going forward, the employees can share um, 
you know, in all of that. And again, the governance structure is what's, uh, what's most important. Um, and again, when you set that governance up in those trust documents, uh, you can make that, uh, you know, very favorable, um, you know, for the employees. And the nice thing about this particular um, arrangement is, let's say the owner um, kind of has a fair market value target in mind for what the value of the company is. Typically in a transaction like this, they're not getting a lump sum payment of that amount. They're being paid over time. And let's say there's one year where the market isn't great. Um, you can put in the trust document where that owner might have less payments. Therefore, there's more profitability for the employees to share. Um, and again, it depends on what's in the documents, but you can certainly put that uh, put that in there. Um, in addition, the Employee Ownership Trust is actually a way to start a company too. We typically just talk about the succession plans and, and things like that. Um, but again, uh, there's typically an initial payment to the owner, and then there's these deferred payments, and those deferred payments um, can kind of ebb and flow uh, based on the performance of the company. Great. Uh, could you just dive in a little bit further into why owners or uh, the employees should consider either transitioning or starting uh, one of these employee-owned trusts? Yeah, I mean, any employee ownership model, um, as you know, really has a lot of benefits um, to the company, which therefore get passed on to the employees. Uh, benefits such as being able to um, be more attractive to hiring employees, uh, more attractive to retaining employees. Um, in addition, typically employee owner, employee owned companies compared to their non-employee owned competitors um, do better from a sales and profitability standpoint. Um, in addition, employees are more engaged. There's typically in an employee owned company, a lot of education that goes into the culture of the company. And so employees are learning not just about how their job affects the company's ability to generate sales as well as generate profit, um, but also they they get to know about the company in general. So some people call that open book management where the books of the company are open to everyone. There's a lot of transparency that way. Um, and that's why the governance involving employees of that uh, particular company is, is really important as well. Once everyone understands how the company functions, they then are much better suited uh, to be involved in the governance of that of that company. Yeah, and I think that's such a great point that, um, you know, bringing all of our heads together to figure out what needs to be done. Right. Uh, we do such... Uh, such a good job working together on that kind of thing, bringing diverse perspectives in, whereas one person um, just has such a hard time seeing all the angles, um, especially when you've been working in a business, you see it from a different angle. Um, Absolutely. I, could you talk just a little bit about uh, some of the different ways in which people design these decision-making mm. processes and like how much responsibility falls on either party or um, just kind of how that looks? I You've talked about it being flexible, but I'm, I'm curious- right how people actually structure it. Yeah. So if you, if you think about kind of the governance structure of an employee owned company in general, you have the owner, you have the employees, and then you have something else there. So again, with an ESOP, you have things like a communication committee and a governance committee with worker owned cooperatives. Um, you have kind of those similar, uh, those similar feels. So you can set that employee ownership trust up to have permanent co uh, committees, um, kind of like a nonprofit is structured with a board. Um, and you can also uh, set up task forces to um, do different things um, as different issues come up. So one of the more important ones has to do with the company culture and really the what 
a lot of ESOPs call an education committee. So you have different members, um, different employee owners on that committee, and those employee owners then are responsible for not just educating the employees on things like did our share value go up and you know and things like that, but also um, again how the business runs and how each job description works within uh, within that company. With the employee ownership trusts in particular, uh, you've got a board of advisors. And again, those employee owners are part of, can be part of that board of advisors. And as you indicated before, you can have one owner, you could have a board of advisors, but now if everyone is involved and engaged, then you have everyone's um, uh, opinion, input, et cetera. Uh, it feels much more fair, right, In from a governance standpoint, um, but also, uh, again, everyone's more engaged, and that's why you see these statistics of higher retention rates, higher engagement, higher profitability um, with employee-owned companies in general. And then, you know, the, the, other, the other one is the reason the owner in, uh, at all considers um, selling their business to their employees is not just those particular things that are related to hiring and profitability of the company, but it's really, they want that company to stay in their community. It's the number one way to do that. And so if you are, if an ESOP is not right, if a worker cooperative is not right in this situation, you have this employee ownership trust option again, to keep your, uh, keep your company going forward in your community rather than say selling it to an outside um, interest, which could usually what happens is the statistic is around three years, something is happening where um, jobs are either taken out of the community or the employees have to move you know, with that company. Definitely. And kind of following on that, like, we want to be realistic about how mm -hmm. these type of models uh, operate. What are some challenges yeah. that these type of uh, businesses face when they do a transition? Yeah. So if you're, if you're uh, transitioning into an employee ownership trust, the, the great thing is it's flexible. The disadvantage is it's flexible. And again, you typically sell your company once, right? And so you want to make sure that you're working either with a really good trust attorney who has done some of these before, um, or you're working with a partner like uh, an organization like Common Trust, who has set up employee ownership trusts um, in multiple states in the United States um, already. So again, the, the advantage, disadvantage is that flexibility. The flexibility is there's such a wide array of different things that it's kind of like an unlimited number of questions that you have to answer. Um, the, the nice thing again about EOTs is that flexibility can be done fairly quickly. So let's say there's an owner with a uh, health issue and um, they really don't wanna sell to an outside interest. You can set up that employee ownership trust but again, you have to work really closely with a trust attorney or uh, with a partner like Common Trust, for example. Wonderful. Could you share with us some examples of, um, or a single example of a, a, a worker-owned trust and what that impact had on the business when it um, transitioned? Yeah, I mean, the uh, using a... Um, so I'm going to use an example. Um, the first employee-owned trusts uh, were done in North Carolina, um, and there's a really good book out there um, about them. The North Carolina um, Employee Ownership Center uh, executive director was the one that did these and then also wrote, wrote the book. So there's a company out there called ShopBot Tools, and they were a very small job shop, six employees. Um, the model there was the owner uh, was up in age. Um, at the time, ESOPs, he was too small for that. 
um, the worker owned cooperative um, was not a model that was going to work for his company based on um, his size. And so he looked at this as an alternative. Um, so he stayed on as the CEO uh, for a short time while he uh, looked for an outside CEO. Uh, the great thing was there was somebody internal um, that stepped forward and was able to do that, which which was fantastic. That's really kind of the um, the the best uh, scenario. Um, and then what that did for the employees was, I mean, all those things we've talked about, right? Um, everyone was more involved. Uh, the profitability uh, was there and continued to uh, go up. Um, that that owner uh, was able to transition away from the business. And so um, when, you know, it's a win-win for everyone where um, that uh, that owner saw that his business was able to succeed him. And really, if you think about it, most business owners would like to see that. Um, sometimes they talk about things like, um, I would like my children to own it, but that's not always possible. And so having employees who kind of feel like your family anyway, um, own that business, share in the profits, um, and then share in the decision-making going forward, uh, based on the education um, that's provided within the company. Again, there's kind of that win-win scenario. Yeah, and I have to say, sitting in the agricultural sphere, um, mm -hmm. I think that's what interests me most about this model. Um, right. I think a lot of our, our farms in particular are highly capitalized, um, and it's hard for a, a farmer to maybe think about either transitioning the, the management in general, um, but also yeah. their own needs for retirement and right. um, kind of everything that's caught up in that farm. Mm -hmm. um, and so this this idea is really interesting to me to kind of create that buffer where there's a little bit more time and space and um, uh, maybe not quite as high of capitalization needs for the right. people who might be stepping into a business if they're mm -hmm. thinking about a you know a succession plan in an agricultural right. enterprise. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're doing at the Wisconsin CEO is um, educating um lenders and things like that about these uh, particular models not every community bank um and egg specialist lender um you know lends to employee ownership um but when they see the statistics and things like that um they're much more open um open to it um in addition in Wisconsin we are looking at things like um usually in a ESOP or a worker cooperative tra uh, uh transition uh, there's a feasibility study done and we're looking at ways to get more grant money to pay for those feasibility studies. Um, so the kind of that barrier to entry per se is is much, much lower. Um, and and again, there's uh, really good partners um, who have, um, you know, uh, national uh, finance resources um, that can be helpful. And again, I've I've named them um, named them prior, but having those relationships is really important. Yeah, and actually that brings to mind really quickly that here in Wisconsin, um, new in the last couple of years is a, a feasibility grant for cooperative endeavors. Right. And one of the interesting things about that is you don't have to be a cooperative and you don't necessarily have to start one, but you're looking right. into the feasibility. So yes. for folks who are out there, you know, curious about which of these models might work, that might be a mm -hmm. good way to kind of start down the road. Yeah. And, you know, I say it this way is if you can get one of those grants and lower that, you know, lower that barrier to that cost of that feasibility study, one is typically speaking, you don't ever get a feasibility study for your company. And the information in that feasibility study is actually really valuable. In addition to that, part of that feasibility study is to do some uh, financial projections. And so if you can get these financial projections done by an outside professional, which again, is not something a typical small business ever gets, um, that information alone is worth the few thousand dollars that you might have to pay over and above that grant um, in order to do that. Definitely. <clears throat> um, 
kind of you've mentioned that this is a pretty new model yeah. here and it's kind of really getting its first footholds in the US. How mm -hmm. do you envision uh, this business model expanding in the future? And specifically, do you think it has, you know, uh, availability in the agricultural space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's right now it's the dominant employee ownership model in the UK, and that's kind of where it came from and, and, and where it was birthed. And there are companies that are as small as four employees that are employee ownership trusts, and there's there are companies that are in the tens of thousands of employees um, with this model. The reason that I really like it, especially for Wisconsin, is um, you know, like worker cooperatives, it's a it works really well in rural areas where uh, there are you know. Uh, less than 10 employees. And so what I basically say is if you have four employees, it can work in a rural area, it can work on a with a main street company. Um, and so that's where I see this particular model um, doing really well. Um, and again, it's it's probably one of the, it's the number one driver for me as part of the Wisconsin Center for Employee Ownership to get the word out about this particular model and then connect those business owners um, with the resources for either a feasibility study um, in some employee ownership model um, or one of the uh, partners that we work with um, to get basically to kind of get their opinion on, do you think this company is suitable for employee ownership um, going forward. And if the answer is um, even I think so, then moving forward with that feasibility study um, or connecting them to a trust attorney or a uh, employee ownership trust partner um, it, uh, is really important. Well, thank you so much for um, giving us this time. Are there other things that you want to make sure that we include in this? conversation? Yeah. I mean, on the Wisconsin Center for Employee Ownership website, which is just wiceo.org, uh, there are um, resources, videos about the three main types of employee ownership. Um, and if you're still not sure, um, having a conversation with me so that I can understand what your goals are and some of your thoughts, and then referring to some of the partners that we work with to kind of take that next step toward a feasibility study um, would be kind of would be next. And when I refer you to an ESOP partner or a worker cooperative partner, and they both call me back and say, Ryan, I don't, I'm not sure this is right for this particular ownership model then that automatically means you're right for an employee ownership trust. And so the next step then is to, um, you know, get you to that model. Or if you're looking at all three models and we have a discussion that this is the right model for you starting out, then immediately what I would do is, is connect you to uh, an EOT uh, partner and, and get you going um, down that road. Um, as you can tell, I'm just excited to talk to somebody who's um, interested or considering employee ownership, and that's what I'm here for. Uh, we don't lock you into, into any decisions. We want employee ownership to be the right model for you, um, and it's the right model for a lot of different situations. So going, going to that website um, is really kind of your first step.